Hey, welcome to this live stream, which is going to be about chord symmetry. And I'm actually really excited to talk about this one because it is uh, uh, revealing not only about music, but music is revealing about ourselves as humans and how we experience the world, frankly. Um, kind of a large statement, but as we go into uh, this about chord symmetry, you'll see what I'm talking about. So as always, if you're part of the replay crew, let me know where you're coming from and let's dive right in. So uh, chord symmetry, a lot of times here we talk about the geometry of music, how music is inherently geometric and that there are certain patterns at play that inform how music works. So, uh, and when we get into chords, there are really, when you get down to it, there are four basic types of chords. So let me show you what I mean. And uh, in, in music, there are two basic types of intervals in music. They're called tertian intervals. And tertian just means of a third. So by that, I mean, there are uh, major thirds and minor thirds and different combinations of these major thirds and minor thirds make the four types of triads. Triad is just a three note chord. And so in this example, I'm illustrating major thirds uh, or two whole steps, like you can see here with a thick black line. And then a minor third is a whole step and a half step uh, shown here by a white line, okay? So between major thirds and, and minor thirds, which are the two tertian types of intervals, we have a major third, capital M third and lowercase m for minor third. Those are the major chords. So together, if we play C, E, and G, we get, in this example, a C major chord, a major third followed by a minor third. Or if we flip that order, we start with a minor third, lowercase m, and a major third, uppercase m, and we get C, E flat, and G, which has a distinct sound, and we're getting in, we're going to get into why that has a distinct sound. And then we have a minor third in the diminished chord. We have a minor third, lowercase m, minor third, lowercase m, and so that's C, E flat, and G flat has another distinct sound. And then the augmented chord, we're combining a major third, uppercase m, and major third, uppercase m, to get C, E, and G sharp which has its own sound. So each of these chords, each of these triads sounds unique, and it has to do with the interval combination of tertian intervals, whether it's a major third followed by a minor third, minor third followed by a major third, minor third and a minor third together, or a major third and a major third. Now, we're gonna dive into these uh, to really pick them apart, and because it can be easy, to just kind of gloss over it and be like, okay, yeah, those are the intervals of the, the basic chords. Um, what's the point? Let's get into the point because it gets really interesting. And like I say, what we're gonna see is more insightful about ourselves as humans than seems on the surface. So uh, with the major, and, and, and let, me, let me backtrack and say, not backtrack, but step back here, take in the broader question of why this is important because for a long, the longest time, I thought, well, if these are all just made of, of uh, tertian intervals, let's just focus on the, the major chord and the minor uh, chord, for example. If they're just made from tertian intervals, and we have, in this case, a major third and a minor third, or a minor third and a major third, when it gets into different inversions, why, why does a major chord always sound major? Uh, so... In this example, why does C, E, and G, you know, we have a major third followed by a minor third. Why does that sound, you know, distinctly major or for lack of a better term, kind of bright and happy compared to say a minor uh, chord, C, E flat, and G. So a minor third followed by a major third. Well, if we can play different inversions of chords, like for example, how about we play, instead of C, E, G, we play the minor third first, followed by that chord at the top, this note at the top. Why does that still sound like a major chord? You know, if we play, if we start with the minor, interval of the minor third, and then we uh, add C at the top, 
or for that matter, if we play instead of C, E flat, and G, where it's a minor third followed by a major third, if we took a major third, interval of a major third first, and then added C on top, it still sounds like a, a minor chord, even though we started with a major third. And uh, there's a reason for that. Oh, wrong camera there. There's a reason for that, and it has to do with where the intervals fall in this overall pattern. So, for example, I'm showing these chords. Let's just focus on major versus minor for a moment here. And I'm showing these chords with just the tertian intervals uh, illustrated. Again, the thick black line means major third, and the white line means minor third. But there is this, oh, there is this assumed kind of hidden interval that I'm not really depicting explicitly, except for now I am, with this dotted line between, in this case, the fifth and the tonic, or the dominant note in this chord and the tonic or the interval one. Likewise, this one has a fifth and a one. So a one major three and a five in the major chord and a one flat three and a five, that's supposed to be a three, and a five in the minor chord. And so diving into this, it gets pretty interesting. So uh, the reason that this major chord sounds major in any inversion or rearrangement of those notes is because of where the first interval, what, what interval, which of these intervals is touching the tonic? So if the tonic is touching or leading to connecting directly with a major third, interval of a major third with that thick black line, it's going to sound major because there's this interval of a fifth going in this direction or from G to, to C, it's an interval of a fourth. To bridge that gap, it's an interval of a fourth. Likewise, from G to C over here, it's an interval of a fourth. Or if you count from C to G going in this direction, it's a five. So let me just undo some of these lines to get it a little cleaner and let's compare the minor chord C to E flat from the tonic, we have this white line because it's the interval of a minor third. So, and it's because the tonic is always the, the note that is, has a big gap to its left or below in this example. So we have this interval of a fourth, it's the largest gap, a fourth, an interval of a fourth is bigger than an interval of a third. And so you know that G in this case is the, the dominant. So you can almost think of the chords, if we were to personify the chords, the notes in the chord, as almost like the tonic is the, the general, you know, like of, of the group. And then this is like the lieutenant. The, the dominant is like second in command. It's dominant, but it's still ranked in terms of hierarchy or power lower than the tonic. So even though there's a major third going to the, the lieutenant or the second in command in the minor chord, it, what really matters is that the minor interval is touching or connected to the tonic in the minor chord, and that's what makes it minor. Likewise, in the major chord, that major third is stemming off from or connecting the, the third of the chord with the tonic, and it's a major chord. Um, and so that is why in any permutation or any inversion, in other words, of a given chord, there's always that interval of a major third connecting to the tonic. So let's look at the keyboard again. So C is our, our general, you know, our five-star general <laughs> in this chord. And the fifth is an important note but it's not as important. And so even though there's a minor third here, the major third is between the tonic and its third. And that's why it sounds distinctly major, even if we were to play it in different inversions, because there's always a major third above the tonic. Likewise, in a minor inversion or a minor chord, there's a minor third above the tonic or the five-star general, to use our personified metaphor. And even though there's a major third between the, the flat three and the five, 
this is just the lieutenant. It's not as, it doesn't rank as high. And so that interval, what matters is that it's coming from the tonic and it's the one above or to the right of the tonic. Now, I just said something really important that we're gonna come back to, which is, and I'll say it again, the, the interval just to the right of the tonic is the, dis, the distinctive interval. So another way to look at this, or another way to describe it is that you can think of, and I'm, I'm using you know the personified terminology of a five-star general versus a lieutenant, but you just might you might say that this is of prime importance, the tonic, and the dominant uh, is of secondary importance. And so, if we were to call the tertian intervals of major thirds and minor thirds by another name, the first interval, the one that's touching the note of primary importance, you could call this a determinant, or it's an interval that really determines the chord. This major third has more of an impact on, on the chord, on the, the resulting harmony, than this secondary interval or the secondary determinant. So in the minor chord, this minor third is a primary, primary determinant in that it's really establishing what follows. And then the secondary or the second interval is of a secondary determinants. I know that's super geeky uh, and it's a lot of syllables, but it really is important uh, when you look at other chords like diminished and augmented. So in this case, we're still you know, treating the C as the tonic where all of these chords are in the key of C, but this first interval, the first interval or tertian determinant <laughs> is establishing that, okay, it's going to sound relatively minor-ish. Um, and then the secondary determinant, the, the second interval further, uh, it's another minor interval, which is saying it's gonna sound even more minor than minor. So in this example, if we take C, we add a minor third, and then we add another minor third, that sounds especially, uh, for lack of a better term, diminished. And that's why it's called diminished because it's not major, you know, it's not, it has this kind of stout, strong sound. It's not minor because that first interval, the first determinant makes it sound relatively minor or weaker. And then diminished is even more diminished. And then if we were to look at the uh, fourth chord here, the first determinant, the first tertian interval is a major third. So it's going to sound, ooh, potentially kind of strong. And then we add a second interval of a major third and it is uh, like especially strong, almost to the point of being too much. <laughs> it, uh, so you take a major third, C to E, and then this, this chord sounds, you have a major chord of a major third and a minor third, and then an augmented chord is a major third and a major third. So two major thirds combined sound, you would think, oh, you know, maybe it's gonna sound even stronger than a major chord but it's almost kind of like unstable or a little less consonant. And uh, let's get into that because it's, it has some important implications in their use in songwriting. So let's look at the chords again with the four basic types of chords. I'm gonna, uh, well, I guess I can leave my arrows, so that's fine. So what, what you'll see here is well, I will get rid of my lines. So let's say that you have these four different types of chords and notice in these first two that I, I connected a dotted line between the tonic and its dominant. The dominant in both cases of the first two, the major chord and the minor chord, so C major and C minor, the fifth note is a G. And you can almost picture the intervals uh, the minor third and the major third in either combination, a major third plus a minor third equals a perfect fifth. Or uh, using the commutative property of mathematics, if you take a minor third plus a major third, that too equals a perfect fifth. So 
I just mentioned mathematics, but music is kind of like its own cyclical multicolor color branch of audible mathematics. It's not like following the, the typical uh, properties of math, uh, which is beautiful because if you're not like into math or like traditionally into like algebra and all of that, it doesn't matter because music is its own thing. And it's arguably a lot more intuitive because it's cyclical and symmetrical. And uh, so what we get here is like, for example, a major third plus a minor third equals a perfect five. So three plus three equals five. <laughs> like that's what I mean is, is music is not your typical math in that the numbers seem wrong, but it's just because of the terminology used. Likewise, we have in the minor chord, a minor third plus a major third equals a perfect five. In both cases, those intervals combine to reach a perfect fifth. You can almost think of these black and white lines in the minor and major chords as almost like levers of uh, like in an erector set, like where you can, you can, uh, you know, it's like I have my forearm. Is this my forearm? This is, I can't remember. <laughs> this is my bicep and my forearm. I think that's what it is. Um, I definitely haven't studied anatomy apparently that much, but um, so you can, you can move it and I can move it in all sorts of di directions. I have these two, I have this joint, but I can only go so far. Like my arms, I'm trying to get the right angle here. My arm can only reach as far as the combination of my bones, right? And so it's the same with uh, these intervals that a major third and a minor third combined can reach as far as a perfect fifth uh, in both a major third or major chord and a minor chord. When we get to the diminished and augmented, it's like we're, we're working with different bones, like a minor third uh, plus a minor third can only reach as far as a diminished fifth. So whereas this, we reached to the, to the perfect fifth with the major and the minor chords, now this can only get that far. The, the erector set or the arm can only reach as far as the diminished five. And so together, the minor thirds make up or, or, or adds to a diminished fifth. And that's why it's called a diminished chord, because that diminished fifth kind of, it's the namesake of that interval. Here we have, so it's almost like the in this, in this example that the arms are too short to reach the more consonant fifth. And that's why it sounds less satisfying. It's more dissonant because that's, we're working with what we got and those intervals are a little too small. The major third plus a major third, it's almost like the bones in this arm are like crammed and reach further. They overshoot that perfect fifth. The perfect fifth, you can see with the colors, red, orange is harmonically related to red. And that has to do with the connection between those notes and the circle of fifths that really the chromatic scale that we're working it with here, which is kind of a, a scrambled uh, color wheel is literally a scrambled color wheel because of the rotation from the circle of fifths to the chromatic scale. So this red orange or G, which is harmonically related to C and is the dominant note in major and minor chords, which are more consonant, it gets overshot by these overly long major third intervals that combine to, to pass it by and you get to this more diminished augmented fifth or sharp five. And that's why these two chords, the diminished and the augmented are not as consonant or arguably as satisfying as these two chords because you can see there's a definite difference here. The, the perfect fifth, the G, is more harmonically related to the tonic. So that is kind of a, a, an overview of the main intervals in these chords and why they have their distinctive sounds. But it gets better, or there's more to it. Because when we look at these intervals and uh, you know, why you know, a major chord always sounds major versus a minor chord always sounds minor is if you look at some interesting connections between these chords, between these intervals. In this example, I took uh, the the notes here, and I imagine there's imagine. Oh, I'm not showing my diagram. Imagine that you take these the notes in this chord, and we're just going to trace. I'm going to zoom in on this. 
we're going to trace this kind of dotted line, squiggly line, that is like an imaginary mirror. Okay. And uh, so between the tonic one and its tritone flat five, which is in this case, G flat, it, it forms this, this mirror symmetry around which we're going to examine these, these, these chords and they show some really cool patterns. So in this example, we have a major third on this side and then the minor third kind of crosses over uh, to this side of the mirror. And if we take the reflection of that, so down the same mirror, if instead of going a major third to the right, we go a major third to the left, and then instead of a major third and a minor third, we take a, let's see, major third and a minor third on the right going clockwise. If we go major third and minor third on the left going counterclockwise, we get uh, an F minor chord instead of C major. So we have C major or F minor. Um, and what an interesting thing about these chords is let's play C major. So I'm going to play right here if I'm still in screen. So we have C major and then F minor. And that those two chords are very often used as a combination of a minor one to a major five. So like in a harmonic minor progression. So when you hear a harmonic minor progression with this very uh, um, Um, when you hear, oh, sorry, hold on just one sec. When you play um, these chords in sequence, there is this uh, strong resolution. And part of the reason that it's harmonically pleasing is because it has to do with this symmetry that's going on between those chords, uh, between a given note and its tritone. Likewise, when you take the minor chords, and we're going to put on the same mirror between the two. Now, in this case, we have a minor third followed by a major third going in a clockwise direction. Or in a counterclockwise direction, we have a minor third followed by a major third. Um, we get a, a C major, or sorry, C minor, I should say, and F major. Oh, F major. So looking at this, we have C minor. So this is a, that is basically the basis of a minor one and a major four you hear all the time in like a Dorian vamp. And so, you know, like that's very uh, prominent in songs by Pink Floyd, Santana, and all sorts of uh, songs that are based on the Dorian vamp. And it's more than just in the Dorian mode, you have a minor one and a major four. There's also a special relationship between those chords due to the underlying symmetry that connects them, which is really cool. Now, when you get to diminished and augmented chords, they're already based on uh, symmetrical patterns that are, that are already like, you know, symmetrical down that line. So if we were to look at these chords combined, we have the the uh, major one and the the minor four, or you know the minor one and the and the major five. Then we have these two chords that we just looked at uh, symmetrically, and then these already form geometric patterns. So um, we're just kind of scratching the surface in terms of symmetrical relationships between chords and how they influence certain chord progressions that are very prominent. And so it's a different look at how these patterns influence the flow of harmonic movement in a song more than just the Roman numerals that are designated within a given key or mode 
there's this underlying symmetry that also informs special connections between them. Um, now, something that's important is that I'm talking about clockwise versus counterclockwise, okay? So in this example, we're looking at the circle of fifths, and this is just a keyboard that shows all the, basically the whole steps and half steps that form the circle of fifths. We've, we've looked at this before, but basically this is like an actual tangible representation of what the, the circle of fifths is often depicted as, as a ring of key signatures in traditional notation. But this makes it less abstract and more concrete in that the key of C is just, you know, all of the white keys. And then the key of G includes one, one sharp, which is F sharp. The key of D includes two sharps, uh, F sharp and C sharp, and so on. So we have an accumulating number of sharps going clockwise. And then uh, likewise, if we play, uh, you know, the key of F it includes one flat. If we uh, play in the key of uh, B flat, we have B flat and E flat. The key of E flat, we have uh, three flats, B flat, E flat, and A flat, and so on. So going counterclockwise, we have an increasing number of flats. Now, why is this important? Why are we talking about clockwise versus counterclockwise? And it's because uh, if you look at these chords uh, with that symmetry that we just looked at, so for example, we play a C major chord where we're, we're treating now the mirror line that we just looked at is right here. So C major third, minor third gets us a C major chord. Or if we do the same uh, pattern in reverse, so the symmetrical image of that, C a major third or a uh, two whole steps down to the left and then followed by a minor third gets us that F minor. So we have C major going clockwise or C minor or F minor going counterclockwise. Likewise, uh, if we do a C minor chord, so a minor third to a major third, so C to E flat is a minor third, E flat to G is a major third. If we do the mirror image of that, again, treating C as the, the mirror, then we have a minor third uh, from C to A, and then a major third from A to F. And so that's where we got the uh, C minor to F major, or the Dorian Vang. So you can imagine, you know, Pink Floyd is, you know, playing around with, okay, that, that chord, and let's do this, the mirror image of that. Ooh, we get this minor one to major four, and let's write Dark Side of the Moon. Um, <laughs> it's probably exactly the, the sequence of thought processes of Red End Album. But you can see that there's a special pattern there, and that is what's going on with these symmetries. But again, when we talk about clockwise, so clockwise in this example is going up to the right, and counterclockwise is playing the uh, pattern down to the left. But it's, it's not necessarily the case that, that that would be what's going on. Like we don't have to just assume that clockwise is to the right and counterclockwise is to the left. Um, it's just kind of how things developed and I, there may be a reason for this. Uh, and that is that, so this is this, the rotation I'm talking about. We, tar we start with the circle of fifths and we take every other note and we rotate those 180 degrees either direction, clockwise or counterclockwise, because 180 degrees is the polar opposite position. We get the chromatic scale. And then when we take this sequence and we go to the right, we get uh, rising from left to right, the chromatic scale. But why is it clockwise? Like why, why are we going clockwise? Why is from low to high? Why is this low? And why is this high? And, uh, because we could, we very well could have just done the opposite. This is showing basically the mirror um, image of it. So here we have the circle of fifths, but going to the right, it's fourths and going to the, the left it, or counterclockwise, it's fifths. We could have done the rotation so that we have the chromatic scale and then from low to high, this is low and this is high. Why isn't it, why isn't it that direction? You know, cause in theory we could have a keyboard that instead of, Going, going from left to right, if I did that, it went and it got lower and lower and lower. Um, it seems like it's just a given, like, oh, okay, yeah, that's just how it is. But 
why is that? Why is high right and low left? Because on a guitar, you know, I can hold it as a right-handed player. I'm holding it uh, as a right-handed player. I can rise from, you know, E to F to F sharp to G to G sharp to A to A sharp to B to C and so on. From left to right, I'm getting higher. But if I flip it as a, you know, a, a left-handed player, I can see that, you know, from, and this is going to be kind of awkward for my hands, but I can, I can rise from low to high from right to left. So I think guitarists could kind of conceive of this more than say piano players where it's just, it's locked in from left to right is low to high. And I think it has to do with chirality, which is in essence, the, uh, the difference between left and right and the way that our, and back to the joints, you know, the fact that our arms can move in certain directions. Like if I, if I try to bend my elbow and hyperextend, it's called hyperextend because it's extending too far to what is healthy. <laughs> you know, I, I could snap, snap my muscles and, and go to the hospital to really go beyond what my muscle should and can do um, because uh, our anatomy kind of limits our motions. And so left-handed versus right-handed, there are certain, even though we're symmetrical as humans, there are certain uh, motions that are more conducive to a given direction. And looking at the stats here, 85 to 90% of people on earth are right-handed. Um, they don't make special scissors for right-handers. They make special scissors here. I'm going to draw some scissors for, those are supposed to be scissors, left-handed players uh, or left-handed people who are left-handed because they're in the minority. Uh, there are fewer people. And so it makes sense that if 85 to 90% of the population uh, is right-handed, the world, just like with scissors and a lot of things, are going to be designed for right-handed players. So coming back to the keyboard, um, the, the motion of, and just the logic of from low to high, um, seems more conducive to right-handed players. Um, like if I were to, you know, speak abstractly of time, you know, from left to right, you know, you, you look at bar graphs or, or, you know, line graphs and left to right is the sequence, you know, from past to future. Um, it's, it's kind of it favors and it's just baked in, I think, as, as a, a favoritism thing for right-handers to plot things in that way. So when we look at a keyboard as from low to high, that also implies that a major third to the right is a, is a major chord. But we could, in theory, have the same motion if we were going to the left to have a major third rising up and be a major chord to the left. But as it is, because music is uh, asymmetrical in the sense that a major and a minor chord are, are mirror images, that it's not... It's not the same going in either direction. Uh, it, it dictates the chord shapes based on what we chose to be clockwise or counterclockwise. Uh, and I think it has to do with the fact that most people are right-handed. So, because in theory, music could be uh, the other way around. So we're basically talking about reflections and uh, this, this is the basis, this is our framework that we could have reflected it this way, uh, a reflection going from, from top to bottom uh, isn't really a factor because of the symmetry that's involved. Um, so, so this is what I'm talking about in terms of symmetry. And when it comes to music, basically what, the, the, what I'm saying here is that we as, it's a shared symmetry, we as humans have our own symmetry, we have our own uh, inherent uh, symmetry <laughs> when, you, when you look at things. And then you have the symmetry of music, which is also symmetrical. Uh, it, it's not limited by joints and ergonomics and, you know, rotations of wrists and muscles and tendons. It's more flexible in that you could go either way. But we're basically 
a symmetrical life form interacting with this symmetrical language of music. And it results in some really interesting patterns uh, more than just the, for the GWIS file. Like I say, the Dorian Vamp is in essence showing the symmetry or a harmonic uh, minor progression is showing the symmetry. There's a definite application of these ideas, but just the ideas themselves are pretty awesome. Uh, and that's what I mean by uh, dissecting even the four basic chords is insightful and revealing about perception and us as people. So anyway, that's kind of uh, what I want to talk about in a nutshell. Um, if there's any uh, comments to jump into, maybe we can just geek out on those. Um, hey, Adrian, it's cool to see you on. Uh, don't they call a diminished chord a double minor? So looking at the diminished chord, so we'll just keep C as the tonic in our example. So a minor third to a minor third. Um, I know of it as a diminished chord. Um, so I don't know. That's a good question, actually. Uh, I'd have to look into that terminology. I've just kind of adopted diminished and referred to it that way. Um, that's a good question. Uh, Troll can play piano. Love your name and love that you're here. Thanks for joining. Um, so I wonder if the sound wave looks like your chart. Yeah, you know, there's the, uh, that's an interesting question. So looking at some of these charts, um, there's the, let's, let's zoom into, uh, pardon the scroll here, some of these diagrams. So um, there are sound wave properties when you get into overtones and undertones and all of these frequencies involved with the underlying relationships between notes. And then there's the visible geometry of things so music theory means by definition to see sound. Theory comes from the Greek theoria, which means to look at, view, or see. Music is sound. So music theory means to see sound. And you know, you can you can visualize um, these patterns using frequencies. Uh, I've always been drawn to the the geometry of things because music is inherently geometric. And uh, I can't really play with the frequencies. I mean, I, I use frequencies, for example, in editing software, you know, like in GarageBand or any of those tools to uh, edit the sound properties. But to make sense of and work with and interact with these these patterns on an instrument, whether it's a piano or a guitar or whatever, um, it's using the geometry. And, you know, you see some of the uh, the the visualizations of intervals or, or I should say frequencies with like sand on a drum, you know, where you, you vibrate the drum and the sand forms different geometric uh, frequencies based on those, those sound frequencies. Um, I guess a long answer to a, sh a short question is uh, there is some overlap and similarity geometrically wise, but these patterns are definitely, um, a little bit distinct from the, the waves themselves. Um, Adrian, so uh, are these major and minor chords just mirrored stacked thirds? If so, pretty cool. Yeah, so that's in essence uh, what we're saying is that, and it's kind of cool if you look at uh, this, I was uh, I was talking about this with my son and he uh, said, hey, that kind of looks like someone who's sitting in a yoga position <laughs> with their arms crossed saying, "Om," you know, like uh, there's, there's, uh, pretty cool visualizations. Of course, the personifying of these these notes is helpful sometimes. Um, but yeah, that's in essence what we're saying is that they are mirror images due to that chirality. Uh, Javier, cool. It's cool to see you on. Thanks for joining. Um, it might be cool to take the note charts on the z-axis according to actual frequency. That's interesting. Um, yeah, to visualize these patterns is to solidify the concepts. You know, music is this auditory art form and good on you. If, if you can just hear these patterns and make sense of it, you know, a lot of people and a lot of the musicians who I've, you know, been so inspired by are auditory learners. And so it's, they're almost like magicians. Like they can hear these patterns and they can make sense of them in their heads as a visual learner myself to actually see these patterns, like makes it stick for me. And so, you know, to visualize these in, in yet another way would, would be very insightful. Um, 
Uh, key music, I mean, just to place the notes not only around a circle, but also to give them height according to their frequency. That's super interesting. That's uh, that's an interesting way to visualize it, or visualize it. But yeah, I think that uh, what happened is what you'd get a sort of a helix spiral. That's interesting. Yeah, um, I'm working on lesson 19 right now, uh, which has to do with the circle of fifths. And even just this last week, um, I've been spotting patterns in in things that I've never noticed before, which is kind of crazy. Um, it, but it's like, that's the thing that music is this sidewalk that never ends. Like the, the more you get into it, the more you see that it's teeming with these amazing, beautiful patterns. Spirals are one of them. Um, Dave Mercer, it's a machinist thing. Z axis. I love, I love, uh, that you're on Dave. It's cool to see you on. And yes, I can see the Z axis being a machinist thing. Um, it's all, it's all basically engineering, uh, different, different ways of looking at things. Uh, Supnega, cool to see you on. Um, so why E, A, and B are black and the rest of the notes are white. So, uh, let's look at the keyboard here. And, um, now we do have, there are seven in a given octave. So from C to C, right? This pattern just repeats up here. So from C to C. We have you know two black keys three black keys and then between this c and c we have two black keys and three white keys and uh the black keys are you know d flat e flat g flat a flat and b flat um so uh e is white a is white and b is white on a keyboard anyway and the reason just a high level answer to that is th the reason for this topography or the black and white pattern is because back in the day, like if you had, if every other note was just black and white, then you end up with just an alternating black and white keyboard where you couldn't distinguish any of the notes from each other. And so it would be very difficult, impossible, frankly, to, with your fingers alone, like Stevie Wonder wouldn't be able to like play the keyboard. He, Stevie Wonder's blind. And so he wouldn't be able to find the keys because everything would feel uniform and except for with his ears, he couldn't like distinguish the, the pitches with his fingers. Um, the cool thing with these, with the colors, with color music is that you can see past the black and white, like x-ray vision to see the actual underlying intervals that really matter, all of the whole steps and the half steps, which are at the most basic level, what really inform the creation of scales and chords and modes and all of that. Um, so, uh, yeah, the the black and white is basically just to to help distinguish keys with your eyes closed. Um, yeah, so there is a lot of uh, a lot of patterns going on in music. This is just kind of like I say, scratching the surface in terms of um, some of the symmetries involved. Uh, as as I'm. Uh, publishing part five and diving into everything that goes with that, which has to do with the fretboard matrix, uh, chords, extended chords, chord inversions, uh, modes, and everything that goes with modes, the circle of fifths and all of that. Um, there is, it's all about symmetry and uh, the application of those patterns. Because again, music theory is to apply in songwriting, just like you would never learn chess just to learn how to play chess, you'd want to play the game. And so uh, we'll, we'll dive more, dive in more on these symmetries and their application as we go forward. Um, so that is in a nutshell, chord, chord symmetry. Uh, well, it's not in a nutshell, that's kind of like scratching the surface, as I say. We'll dive into it more as we go. So thanks for joining. This was uh, definitely a geeky one, but some cool applications and uh, more on symmetry, chords, and all that good stuff coming up. So I hope you have a great rest of your day and evening, and we'll talk very soon. We'll see ya.